Some call them millennials, some call them Gen Y, and some just call them whiners. But whatever you call them, they're the next generation, and we wanted to evaluate the merits of the generational generalizations that abound about these up-and-comers. Joining us now to do that, Shannon Lee Simmons, financial planner and founder of the New School of Finance, Michael Hahn, social demographer and Canada Research Chair at Western University in London, Robin Urbach, columnist and member of the National Post Editorial Board, and Nancy Worth, social geographer at York University, heading up the Gen Y at Home project. And it's good to welcome one, two, three millennials, I guess, and one normal person like me <laughs> to one our program. One, <laughs> one non whiner to yeah. our program tonight. Great to have you here, everybody. Uh, we uh, are having this conversation in advance of. Uh, My Millennial Life, which is a documentary which will play tomorrow night, 9 p.m. on TVO. And to that end, Sheldon, can we bring this up? Because everybody's asking, you know, who are these millennials? According to those who know, if you're born between 1981 and 97, you're a millennial. That feels a little on the high side to me, but anyway, that's what it says in the yearbook. And then you go down the list there, Gen Xers you see, baby boomers, the silent generation, and then, of course, as Tom Brokaw called them, the greatest generation. This is the World War II generation. But we're going to focus on the millennials here. And, Michael, I guess just to get us started, tell me whether you think it's useful to even categorize people in that way. Well, it depends on your perspective. I would say as a social demographer, those categories are probably not useful because they're very large. I mean, talk about, talking, about experience, talking about the fertility, mortality, and migration trends of a 17-year-wide cohort doesn't necessarily seem meaningful. So what we'll typically do instead as demographers is divide it a little bit more finely. Hmm. Robin, there is something, though, to knowing, or I presume there's something to saying, Paul McCartney for me is a beetle and Paul McCartney for you is a wing. <laughs> Right? <laughs> I guess so. I mean, th these uh, generational classifications are useful just in terms of the way that we conceptualize different groups of people. So we like to put people into categories just so that we understand them better. We do it with all sorts of things in our lives, and it's a way for us to take seemingly diverse pieces of information and cluster them all together so that we understand, in this case of people, their motivations, their shared experiences, their values, their goals, etc. Shannon, who does that serve, doing that? I think that it serves us for understanding people. So, um, like, in my job, it's helpful because it's a clean line in the sand. Like, oh, if you're a millennial, these are typically the things that might be associated with experiences that you're having. Oh, if you're a boomer, this is typically something that you might be experiencing. So for that kind of social categorization, it's helpful. Is there a handy-dandy list of things that people of these different cohorts share, the big experiences, and what would they be? I mean, we talked about the greatest generation being World War II. What would it be for everybody else? Well, for millennials, I think it's the economic crisis of 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. So they're all entering the workforce, finishing school, at a cr critical moment for entering the labor force, and it collapses around them, right? So it's not the idea of having one singular event that affects everybody the same way, but in terms of where you are in your life, your life stage, and going through social events around the same time becomes mm -hmm. really powerful. That's interesting, right? Because I, I would have thought, you know, I'm looking at the years born, 1981 to 1997, I would have thought 9-11 would have been a seminal influence in their lives, no? Well, it, interestingly, uh, I, I was teaching, I was tr teaching an stati early statistics course a few years ago, and I asked them, I, had, I, thought, I thought, why not have a conversation with my students uh, and <laughs> get to know them? And I asked them, what's 9-11 to you? And, and I was shocked to find out that they had a very vague notions about what actually happened. They, they knew that there were some buildings that had gone down. They knew that Saddam Hussein, or they hypoth hypothesized that Saddam Hussein was somehow involved. Uh, one student actually thought that Hussein was one of the pilots in the plane. So it, it, was, it was very These vague. University? Students? These were university students, first, second, and third year university students. I think there's a difference. It was a deep there. exhale there, Robin. <laughs> if you're talking about someone who was born in 1997, who is maybe you know four or five years old, they would probably have no recollection, or their recollection Absolutely. would be very vague. Whereas myself personally, I think it was in middle school when 9/11 uh, happened. I can remember exactly what classroom I was in, what screen I was looking at, what happened on the news, where I went that night. So it goes back to your point about it being a rather wide or a, a large range of uh, an age group that we're talking about here because there's such a diverse uh, group of experiences within that fairly wide age margin. Okay, but, but Nancy, you're at York University. Is yeah. there a single university student in this province who should be allowed to be off the hook for not knowing what 9-11 is? Well, it's a difference between learning about history and living through it, right? I think, okay. that's, that, I think that's the difference. 
But if you didn't live through it, surely you got to know what of, it is. Of, of course. Okay. Of course. On this weekend, agree. <laughs> all right. Let me move on here. I want to play a little tape here. This is, you all know, the TV show Survivor. How many years is that going on now? Too many. Like since Too 99, many? maybe? Yeah, it's a long way. I was going to say 15, but it's even more than that. Uh, you know, their latest thing, well, it speaks for itself. Millennials versus Gen Xers is the latest thing. <laughs> Roll tape. It's Survivor. Millennials versus Gen X. It's hard work. It's not how fast I can type it on Google, find the answer. And the millennials, they don't have a clue what their life's going to be like or what they're doing. They don't have a plan. They certainly haven't been battle tested. If you haven't ever been knocked down, then you don't know how to get up and fight. I think the older generations, they've been brainwashed with this. You have to have a career. You have to do A, B, C, D. And I'm a free man. Like, I don't like to be caged. You can do whatever the hell you want. And I'm going to go do it. Hashtag Soul Survivor. You're constantly told, grow up, stop playing. It's not a game. This is life. But I play video games online for a living. It's a blessing, and it's because I'm a millennial. I don't feel like most young people are quite as driven. I just feel like they're a little bit more, okay, hey, Sarah, Sarah, if it takes me seven years to do school, who cares? My parents are paying for it. <laughs> I'm offended. You're offended. <laughs> well, okay, let's, let's, let's establish that, that uh, this does indulge in every stereotype every we have. Single every one. single one. <laughs> about both sides, frankly. But is there any truth in any of what they're saying? Uh, I think that... I think there's truth that there is a generational divide in the opinions. So um, I do find that with you know people I talk with and people I work with that there are some typical ways that we feel about like Gen X feels a certain way sometimes about millennials and vice versa. So I think that that's true. I think that there are sweeping generalizations that are true there. Um, and I do think that maybe millennials are seen as people who are more. Uh, I mm, how do I say this? Just say it. I think that <laughs> I think that they're more their job market that they're entering into is worse so they don't have those typical jobs and so that can be seen like if you're freelancing or if you're following your dream or whatever it is i think that gen x if they see that they're like oh you don't really have a career you don't really have a job and so they just took that stereotype and just blew it up for on tv and it's well this is the thing because uh you know on the one hand we're told robin that that uh, millennials are going to go get way more education than previous generations um you know because mom and dad are paying for it. Right. But on well, the other hand, if they had a job to go to after they got their undergraduate degree, maybe they wouldn't be going for that master's and that PhD. Fair to say? I think so. Um, I think, I mean, there there is a, a sense of entitlement that we talk about a lot when we talk about millennials graduating from university and this idea that they're going to go out there into the job market and automatically land this amazing job with benefits and a pension and whatever it is. That doesn't exist. But I think that expectation comes from believing in a truth that once was. So that may have been true for millennials' parents a generation ago. They could have gone to university and come out and had a great job and put a down payment on a house and started having kids in their mid-20s, and that's not true. I think the problem, or that's not true today, rather. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is that their kids have bought into that myth that doesn't apply to the modern-day job market and the modern-day society. David Coletto at Abacus Data did a survey a few years back, and we're going to play some of the... Here's some of what he had to find. You use the word millennial, and how do people respond? 56% said millennials were materialistic. Half said they're coddled. A third used the word entitled. A quarter used the word open-minded. 13% said motivated. Only 3% said loyal. What do we think of those, Nancy? Well, loyal to whom? Loyal to a company that's not loyal to them, that hires them on short-term contracts that don't get renewed, that don't pay benefits. I've spoken to people in my research that are putting off having kids until they can find a job with benefits, and they're entering their early 30s, and it still hasn't happened yet. Hmm. So the idea of expecting loyalty but not being given any, I think, is an interesting one. Fair point not to blame the millennials for the fact that these results seem somewhat pejorative? Oh, I agree. And, you know, I, I'm always hesitant to blame people for anything, any, people that are younger than me for anything, because, you know, there's the, there's always this interpretation that, well, people just say that I'm getting old. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, we are these are people that are going through uh, a pretty difficult time, and they're having a lot of trouble in the labor market. And as a result, what we see happening is, yes, they are often living with their parents. They are often delaying entry into the labor, meaningful labor market attachment. But you can compare them to other groups that are new on the scene, like new immigrants and we see indeed that they too are having trouble in the labor market. So they're not doing well either. And it really doesn't make sense to me to blame them for what's going on. 
Here's a couple of other stats we should add to the conversation here. Sheldon, if you would. A quarter of millennials age 25 and older still live with their parents, as Michael suggested. Only half have found a full-time job in their field. Uh, Shannon, uh, you meet with a lot of millennials, I guess, for uh, looking for financial advice, that yes. kind of thing? Okay, in terms of expectations, where are they when it comes to getting that job, getting that house, getting that car, getting married, having kids, etc.? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that, uh, sadly, actually, the expectation that I've seen in the last few years has even gotten more negative. So I think that five years ago when I was doing this, everyone that was coming through in their late 20s was still bright-eyed and bushy-tailed that somehow they would figure it out and they just have to get that job and that break. And now um, the droves that are coming in are like, I'm never going to own a home and I don't know if I'll get a job that is in my field. And there is the rise of precarious work, which is a very creative outlet. And I think a lot of people are really appreciative for that, the rise in entrepreneurship and freelancing in that. But at the same time, it doesn't provide benefits. There is no pension plan. There's no employee matching or anything like that. So those goals of home ownership and um, building equity, they get pushed further and further off because you're still battling maybe your student debt well into your 30s. And so I think that that's disappointing because as you get older, if you want to have a family and start that that kind of adulting if that's something that you want to do it feels like you have to work really hard and then it may not actually work out so that's it, a, yeah it's frustrating that's a new word adulting adulting I haven't heard that before that's a verb there you go it is now <laughs> <laughs> okay. can, can I at the risk of getting a little uh, personal here sure you went to post-secondary I did go to post how many degrees one now that's unusual right? I know it is unusual you got a BA I got a Bachelor of Journalism, actually, okay. and um, I landed a full-time job because bribery is a great thing. <laughs> so therefore, no need to go on for the master's degree. <laughs> well, not, you know, it, it actually is quite an anomaly. Nowadays, people get their undergraduate uh, bachelor's degree, and it's certainly not enough. In most fields, um, that bachelor's degree is the equivalent of a high school degree from 20 or 30 years ago. Right. So not only are you taking on that debt, not only are you spending four years in university, but you're probably going to have to put in more money and more time and more years to get that master's degree or that other sort of graduate degree in order to find meaningful work. And even then, it's not a guarantee. There are lots of master's students out there or, or people with um, MBAs even who are really still struggling to find work. And it happens in professional jobs as well, like, like lawyers, for example. There's a bit of an oversupply in some areas and, and people still can't find mm -hmm. meaningful work. So education is not the ticket to success necessarily that it once was. It's, I mean, it's still the ticket to success. Certainly. But you may have to, um, what, delay your your view of what success is and when it'll happen? Absolutely, Something and like I think there, there was this sort of notion, going back to the idea of loyalty, someone would get a job at a university and stay there for 40 or 50 years and retire. That doesn't seem to be what happens anymore. You might get a job out of university, but it's not going to be your dream job. And you're probably going to jump around a lot. You're probably going to have to do that if you want to accelerate your career professionally as well as monetarily. People aren't seeing the salary increases at the same job that they used to years ago. So in order to graduate from one salary level to the next, oftentimes people are jumping from one job to the other mm -hmm. instead of negotiating within their contracts. Now, Michael, uh, Robin was lucky in as much as she got that one university degree and then found that full-time job. Mm -hmm. Terrific guy. Yes. She's a great columnist, National Post, on the editorial board as well. Not bad. <laughs> uh, I didn't ask. You live in a house or apartment or a condo or what? I'm renting. You're renting. I'm okay. renting. Do you think you'll ever yeah. own a home? I would hope that I do. At <laughs> some point? Well, Shannon said so many have given up on that idea, You know what, I'll pop into Shannon's office. Maybe she can you offer guys me can some talk. advice. In yeah. your experience, yes. do you think that more millennials are going for that second degree because they don't want to find a job? Yes, there is a, it, absolutely. There's a lot of research that shows that people will delay entry into the labor market when the labor market is not receptive. So what we see is that there aren't a lot of new opportunities for young people. So what do they do? They don't want to sit on, they don't actually want to sit on the couch. They want to continue to upgrade themselves without giving the impression that they've, that they've gone down a dead end curve and they cannot turn themselves around. Hmm. Two thirds of millennials, according to a Bank of Montreal survey, BMO, two thirds of Toronto millennials still expect to own their own home. Is that cloud cuckoo land? <laughs> well, it may take them longer. I think there's really good data that shows how long it takes you to save for a down payment has doubled since the 1970s. Yeah, I mean, the average price of a house in this city is a million bucks now. But there's also really creative ways that Gen Y or millennials are making that happen in terms of co-housing or, or buying housing and you split the ownership of it. And they're making it work for those that still want to buy homes. But there are a growing number of people that don't want to buy a home. 
whether that's related to you can't do it, so therefore you choose something else. I think there's a really interesting pattern to be talked about there. Okay. What's Gen Y at home? That's your project, eh? So I'm researching the process of living at home with parents as a young adult. So I've actually taken a cohort of people born between 1980 and 1995, which is roughly the generation of millennials, and I'm asking them, why do you live with your parents? Or your parents or your in-laws? Because there's lots of, it's not just I can't find a job, so I live in my parents' basement. It's maybe I went to school, got a good degree, but maybe I have kids now and my parents are going to help do some childcare. And all of these complex arrangements about why young people live at home, there's really not a lot of explanation about why that's happening. Well, let's hit the stereotype right on the head here. Sure. The stereotype is they're lazy, they still want mom to do their laundry for them, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. How much truth is there to that? I think very little truth, actually. Hmm. Maybe the kid that is living at home in their very early 20s might still be holding on to their, their, their teenage life. But by the time you get into your mid-20s, your late 20s, your early 30s, it's often a very strategic choice to move home or to stay at home. You're paying off your school debt, you're saving for that down payment by not paying rent. It's actually a really smart decision that I think millennials don't get recognized for. As the financial planner here, you sign on to that? I do, um, and what you also hit the nail on the head with is the free daycare situation. So a lot of boomers are like, please bring the babies. And so it actually works for everyone because the boomers are retiring and they wanna be around the grandkids and daycare is exorbitantly high and it's really hard to afford and actually make things work. So often moving in with mom and dad even later on in your millennial stretch, when you have young ones, can be a very strategic move as well for a millennial family who just can't make ends meet during the daycare years. What, Robin, are you hearing about those who don't have the option of having mom or dad available to stay in their basement or maybe even move back into your old room when you finish university and you haven't got that first job yet? What do they do? Uh, it, th there's all sorts of different experiences. A lot of people are moving in with their friends and splitting bills in a way that you wouldn't think that people would actually live. I think it, the other thing that people are doing is they're, they're pushing those goals of having a family down the line, but they're still trying to realize them. Um, the, the difference is the way that we see realizing those goals is a little bit different. So uh, whereas years ago, the dream was to have a house with a backyard and a white picket fence for your kids to run around in, now it might be, okay, I wanna have a condo with a park down the road for the kids to run around in. It was sort of uh, almost taboo years ago to think, okay, well, I'm gonna move into an apartment or a condo with a bunch of kids and I'm gonna live downtown, where now that might just be the reality. If you want to own your own home and you want to live in a, an accessible area, one where you can get to work by transit, for example, you might have to live in a condo or in a tall building, and, and some people are choosing to raise their kids like that. Mm -hmm. Shannon, a little uh, financial follow-up with you. Uh, based on your experience with the people you deal with, what percentage do you think have to take money from their parents in order to be able to afford to buy a place? Oh. So there's a lot of, gift, of gifting that happens. Mm -hmm. And I would say, in my experience, uh, probably 70% of the people that are buying homes within the GTA uh, are experiencing gifting from parents. Now, that range can be anything from, hey, guys, we'll help you with the closing costs, which is still very generous. Um, like, you know, here's $10,000. And I've even seen some gifts that are as high as, like, Three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars. So there is a huge range between help from your parents, um, and the one thing that bothers me about that is that a lot of us don't talk about money. So if you buy this home with your partner, and then all your friends are going, "How are you doing this?" You don't say, "Well, my parents gave me one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and that's how." You don't say that. So then everyone just there's this mystique around how mm -hmm. you're managing, and I think that's what I get frustrated at. I have no problem with the gifting as long as the baby boomer parents can afford it. Like, a, you know, put the mask on you, and then you help the baby. <laughs> And again, <laughs> dealing with a stereotype here, Nancy, how many, how many in your experience, millennials, believe that they are entitled to live in as nice a house as their parents or the house that they grew up in because, and therefore their, their boomer parents ought to be helping them do that? I don't think they're entitled at all. I think they're hoping for that and increasingly realizing it won't happen for them unless they change how they do things. So that's why I think it can be a very strategic move to live at home. So I'm really interested in people that can have the privilege of moving home, because it really is a privilege to have parents that can let you move back in. 
there's a lot of people that don't have that opportunity. So mm -hmm. it also creates a lot of differences within millennials as a generation in terms of these gifts. We call them intergenerational transfers of assets. <laughs> and, and, that, and, and that can be That's money, great. but that can also yeah. be like getting someone their first job, introducing them around the office and helping them in the workplace, mm -hmm. or even emotional resources of like helping someone, let's say they're experiencing a period of unemployment. There can also be a transfer of emotional resources across generations. And it also goes both ways. So I think thinking from a generational perspective, it's really interesting to think about the money, the time, the effort that goes between the two groups. Michael, I want to know what's more prevalent in your experience, because I've heard both of these explanations. I've heard boomer parents say, I love this expression, I can't wait to get my kids off the payroll. OK, I've heard that. And I've also heard, you know what, I've had a great life. My kids are in tough. I'm happy to give them whatever they need to get on the way. Which is it? Uh, a, a bit of both, probably. Mm -hmm. I, 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 do, do you mind if I just for a second? I have a bit of an ax to grind about baby boomers because they, they, they arrived on the scene after World War II, and that was a period of unparalleled economic growth. So mm -hmm. they sort of arrived in a, in a fledgling housing market. They took off. They built the suburbs. They, they contributed to urban sprawl. They, they, they had unparalleled opportunities in the labor market. And you know now, at a rate as we approach 2011, baby boomers were supposed to start retiring. And what do they do? Well, they, they, they work as hard as they can to, to get rid of mandatory retirement. So millennials... In, in, in fairness, because the yes. market tanked and their 401ks aren't worth what they used in, to be. Indeed, and 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 their, their million dollar homes are worth 900,000 now. Well, so, a... <laughs> yeah, and and I, I, don't, I don't, I'm kidding partly, but you know, the idea is they had, they had very specific conditions with which in, within which they entered the labor market, within which they entered Canadian society. The same is true for millennials. So when, when baby boomer parents say, well, why can't our kids do exactly the same things that we did? Well, the short answer is because it's an entirely different time. And you can't expect the same outcome under these different contexts. I think that the, the best expression I heard on this one is, you know, they were born on third base and they thought they hit a triple. Yeah. You know, they, they didn't hit the triple. They, they won the lottery is basically the way that worked. Shall we do this quote board here? Um, Sheldon, bottom of page five. Here's Emma Title uh, in the Toronto Star. Sorry, rival newspaper there, Rob. Today it's okay to act like a kid even if you aren't one. Maybe especially if you aren't one. For the demographic previously known as adults, there's no shame in participating in a variety of childlike activities, from hoverboarding or drone flying to escaping from locked or booby-trapped rooms, a popular and expensive activity available at art galleries and museums in many major cities, or yes, adult coloring. I heard you two talking about this ahead of time. What is, what is with that? The escape room? Yeah. And <laughs> they're fun. <laughs> so you go in and with a group of people, and then they set you up with a bunch of problems to solve, and you kind of work together as a team and escape the room under a specific period of time. Why do, uh, can I call you adults? <laughs> why, <laughs> How dare you? Why do uh, millennial adults seem to enjoy what appear on the outside to be such childlike activities? Well, I mean, perhaps it's symptomatic of the fact that our childhood is sort of collectively prolonged, just the fact that we're putting off marriages longer, we're not getting those full-time jobs, we're not owning property until much later. It might also be a rebellion of the fact that in so many aspects of our lives, we're forced to kind of act like children. I know for, for some people, it is a privilege to move back home. For other people, it's kind of an admission of defeat. Like, mm. I couldn't make it on my own. So you're back at home and your mom's folding your laundry and making your lunch and you kind of feel like a kid. So you say, you know what, I'm going to embrace this whole thing and buy myself a coloring book and hoverboard down the road. Hmm. Well, what's wrong? I also don't see a problem with that. I mean, daily life is a grind. It's really hard and a lot of people are cobbling together a living and what's wrong with having fun and I think that what you said was interesting is that because we're prolonging having kids as a generation mm -hmm. you have um, maybe a higher adult income without the responsibility of a mortgage and kids yet so you have higher disposable income for a little bit longer time and mm -hmm. so when you have activities but you don't have any responsibility like a, like kids um, you have an opportunity that you can actually go and enjoy something on the weekend after working very diff very very hard during the week would you agree that Millennials are are what's the word delaying their adulthood well, they have to, because it takes longer to reach some of these milestones that generations reached previously. But back to the point about youth culture, I think that's something that every generation of society is dabbling with. Our society now is a youth culture in terms of what we do in our spare time and how we organize ourselves. It's not just millennials that like to fly drones. As a, I, everybody does. That's, it's a new standard of what we see as being fun and being social. Hmm. So I think it's 
difficult to sort of frame things as this is a millennial thing or a millennial problem. And they'll also work longer, right? So, so there's a delay at the front end, but there's also going to be an extension at the back end. So, so these, I don't expect that millennials will be on average retiring at age 65 no. down the road. I don't expect so. We're going to live forever. Right. Retirement <laughs> planning is really <laughs> hard. <laughs> One other thing, if I, was, if I was responsible for healthcare service delivery in the province, mm -hmm. I would be pretty excited that all these people are staying home with their parents as their parents are about to get really expensive on the healthcare system. But if they're as useless as everybody says they are, no, they're not. They're not going to be all that. Not. No, there. I'm just done. They can learn. Care goes both ways. Yeah. It does. Generationally. So you think the uh, millennial generation will take care of their parents once the parents start ailing? Absolutely. They're the new sandwich generation. They're they're the increasingly they're going to be the generation that has the young kids and older parents. That's they're going to be their new reality. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I, I, I get the demographics of it, mm. but of course the insult is that uh, they're too self-indulgent to take care of their parents and they're going to, you know, contract that out to somebody else. I don't know where that comes from. If you talk to a lot of millennials, I don't think that's a term they use about themselves at all. Hmm. I picked that up from Survivor, <laughs> okay. uh, where I get all my information about how to do these things. Um, Nancy, how much of this, at the end of the day, is all about the uncertain economy we find ourselves in today? I think a huge part of it. That's mm -hmm. fundamentally what my work looks at. I previously did, did a study around gender and precarious work, around what kind of light or experience you have in the labor market, how that filters into every other decision in your life in terms of when and if to get married, when and if to have kids, when you can or do you want to buy a house. Whether you can put a, together a sort of standard working relationship with the, with the labor market is increasingly, increasingly difficult. Hmm. And there are some that are able to sort of skip above it all and be freelancers and take work when they need it. But for the vast majority of millennials, it's very difficult to plan anything if you don't know when your job is going to end or when you, if you might get hired again or you might not. Well, let me ask Robin about that because, you know, you, 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 did, you did really well really early in your mm -hmm. career. And I wonder how many of your millennial colleagues are kind of just a little bit ticked off and jealous at you that you've done so well so soon. <laughs> well, if they are, they're saying it behind my back, so that's okay. They're not I think it to you. What's unusual, though, in my industry is it's consistently precarious work, and it doesn't matter how old you are, because when you work in journalism, there's an uncertainty about what's going to happen tomorrow. and Especially if you work at the National Post, exactly. I suspect. Exactly, yeah. So it's something that, frankly, everybody in at my paper and in, in this industry is experiencing. So while it, it, it certainly is more widespread among millennials, there are certain industries where it just affects everyone equally, I think, mm -hmm. regardless of when they were born, how old they are, et cetera. Michael, there is a tendency, and this goes back, I think, to the greatest generation. There is a tendency to say that the generation that comes after us just isn't quite as good as we were. So the, the older people who are looking at the millennials today and saying, they're just not cutting it, you know, that's kind of a, 20th century phenomenon, 21st century phenomenon, isn't it? it uh, Aristotle and Plato were complaining about the generation after that followed them, <laughs> and they were, and it's, it's you so know, it's noted. Go so this goes years. back a long time. I think what we need to do is actually break apart this model where we expect generations to follow the pathways of their, of their predecessors, and instead think about the fact that every single generation sort of blazes its own trail just like the baby boomers did, Gen X, Gen Y, et cetera. So here we have the millennials doing something new yet again. So why don't, why don't we as a society, first of all, take responsibility because we made them, right? We, we, we trained them, we built the parks for them. And second of all, embrace who they are and figure out how we can capitalize on their strengths. I mean, they have unparalleled technological expertise. They have interesting new ways of connecting with one another. Why don't we all sort of embrace that and say, what, how can we make this a positive? Hmm. And one wonder, Shannon, whether, I'm wondering, when you're 50, are you going to look at the next generation down and say, ah, bunch of slackers? Of course. You I are. think that, <laughs> I'm going to try not to, but I do think that, um, you know, if you've had a good time, like the, the baby boomers, or if you've had success, you want, especially with the boomer millennial relationship, you want that for your kids. You want, if you had something really good, you want that for them too. So if they're not having it, you, you're frustrated for them and you're upset for them, you want to help. And so I do think that we take our own experiences and then we do put them on our expectations of our kids and it's, you have to actively try not to do that. So I think learning about this generation and um, looking at the next generation and always looking at their strengths instead of at their weaknesses, I think is also important for all of us. There was sort of a, an expression in my generation which was the kids are gonna be okay. 
They're going to be fine. They are, and that's they're that's going to live forever, works. but they're going to be fine. <laughs> okay, good. There were similar panics for Gen X and baby boomers as well yeah. when, when they were young. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So I think we're just going through the same thing about that for millennials until millennials take over the labor market, and that's already happening. Mm -hmm. In terms of <laughs> labor force participation, we're outpacing the baby boomers now, right? So it's going yes. to be a new reality in terms of who makes up the workforce. And that's why we're having these like, sort of moments of crisis and uncertainty as that change takes place. That was a very evil laugh, incidentally. Maniacal, <laughs> Maniacal that's the word. Uh, can we remind everybody that tomorrow night, 9 p.m., right here on TVO, My Millennial Life, the documentary, will be on. Uh, for more information on that, you can just go to tvo.org. And uh, as we look, uh, there they are. We just saw the names of the two producers come up, Harrison Lohman and Kara Stern, who are, of course, a couple of slacking millennials. Just thought we'd add that as well. Thanks for joining us tonight here on TVO, everybody. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.